Good day, everyone. It's, it's great to be here today, and I really appreciate the invitation to come and have a yak for a little while. Um, I'm here to talk about battery storage and my views of it, and, and I guess its place in the, in the sun in terms of its disruptive influence upon life, the universe, and solar energy. Just to give you a little bit of a, a sense of where I come from, as Claire alluded to, I've got a technology background, started a, a broadband company, and um, in my own little way, I've, I guess I've been a solar citizen for a while in the background as well. Back in 2010, so five and a bit years ago, I was inspired back when solar panels cost a fair bit more and when batteries cost a heck of a lot more and the electronics cost a heck of a lot more to go and stick 10 kilowatts of panels, 20 kilowatt hours of lead acid batteries and a whole lot of electronics and monitoring gear in my house. At the time I did it, it was a $100,000 proposition. It was crazy, right? It wasn't about return on investment. That was just me liking this technology and wanting to be an early adopter of it to understand it. And so I suppose that, that in hindsight, I realized that the, for me, that was the sort of the pump priming moment to get me interested in this space and to get me interested in understanding the merits of having energy storage sitting alongside solar panels for really quite a long time ago. The other thing in the midst of this is, is in the, around about 2008, I met a gentleman called Elon Musk at a conference in California. And at that point, the Tesla Roadster, the first electric car that Tesla made, was a Word document with a computer-generated picture of how good it was gonna be. <laughs> and again, being an early adopter, I immediately ordered one. And that was because for me, I loved EVs, I've loved EVs forever. And so Elon Musk was the first person who offered to sell me an electric car that I didn't have to make myself and that didn't suck. Right? I wasn't actually after a sports car, it's just that was what he was making. If he'd made a bread van, I would have bought that. So I'm a huge fan of Tesla, and this is important for some what I want to say. Um, it really, part of the message in my mind here is about horses for courses. Huge fan of Tesla. Um, I've been incredibly fortunate to be successful in that first business that I started, the broadband business, and it meant that I started looking for other things to invest in that might be useful ways to use technology to help to change the world, and that's led me, of course, surprise, surprise, to batteries. Back in the Tesla world, having brought the first Tesla Roadster into Australia in 2009, um, I wound up taking delivery. That was a left-hand drive Californian one, so I ran it alongside the global, I ran it in the Global Green Challenge alongside the solar cars from Darwin to Adelaide in 2009, just to see if you could drive a car from Darwin to Adelaide on electrons. At that point, followed to the enormous amusement of journalists by a diesel generator on the back of a truck, because I needed to bring my charging infrastructure with me. <laughs> They didn't get it, they didn't get what I was trying to do. I wasn't trying to prove the charging infrastructure, I was trying to understand if an electric car would just do the job. And of course it did the job, you know, duh. But it was useful to achieve that. When the Tesla Model S's came into the country, that keenness turned into me and my wife becoming owners number one and two of the Tesla Model S. So I'm, you know, I'm the early adopter when it comes to, to Teslas, right? Um, love them, awesome, awesome vehicles. Here's the thing, those batteries are fantastic in a car, they're the right thing in a car, you need the energy density. In my view, and that's biased, for reasons you'll discover, um, but it's still, I think, accurate, it's not the ideal technology to use for battery energy storage in a home, or at least there are other alternatives that are worth considering, whichever one of those you're kind of more comfortable with. This is the year that the notion of adding battery storage to a solar system in a home, and indeed in other places in the overall grid, is just, you, you can feel it, it's just going mad. You know, if there was, if, if I feel like I've been paddling along on a surfboard waiting for the wave, and ye gods, the wave's coming now. So what's done that? I mean, there's, there's the flashy bit that's done that, and you know, the Prius moment, if there's such a thing for batteries at home, is absolutely Tesla, it's the Tesla Powerwall. And it's amazing how much community awareness you can raise with an empty piece of fiberglass in a choice of colors. You know, it's, and it's, that's not a criticism, it's the reverse, it's actually, they have lit a fire under the notion of putting this storage in your home, and I hope I didn't mean that literally. It, the other thing, that's the, other thing that's, that's the real catalyst right now that's gonna drive battery adoption in my view, and it's again just a timing thing, is, is feed-in tariffs. And the fact that in a number of states, feed-in tariffs start to roll off over the next two or three years. The very old ones last for a long time, the mid-range ones typically go away. And as you guys understand, but it's worth, it's worth repeating it in your own mind, what a feed-in tariff does is actually quite distortive in terms of economics. It, you know, it, it's brought the solar panels in and I think it's a bloody good idea, but what it does is turns the grid at the cost of the government into a battery that pays you to use it. If you send power out and get earn 40 or 50 cents a kilowatt hour when you send it out, if you buy it back in at 15 cents a kilowatt hour overnight, you have been paid to go through that cycle. A cycle which in fact helps the grid quite a lot because you're sending it out when it needs it, but nonetheless you're being paid to do that. When the feed-in tariff goes away, if you're someone who has it go away, 
that equation flips to one where you are now sending power in for almost nothing and paying to bring your own power back later on. So now you are, in fact, using your lovely panels to subsidise the business model of the energy retailer that you may or may not particularly like, but that's probably not going to increase your like of them. <laughs> so that's the trigger point, right? What do you do about that? Well, you don't, you know, you, you don't get mad, you get even. Logically, you stick a battery in your house, you keep that energy yourself, you use it yourself overnight, you self-consume, and you drop your energy use from the grid dramatically. And in the process, not only do you not care so much about sending it out, you're sending out so little, you really don't care that much about it. You know, you've, you've become a different sort of user and operator. You've actually made your own little power station in a really interesting and a really genuine way. So that's, that's a really interesting thing to have go on. One of the things that you want to do here is understand how disruptive that is, but you also want to think about it in terms of what you do next. There's a really strong meme, a really strong sensibility, and I'm sure that many of you have it, that, that says you're going to take the fact that you're mad as hell stick a battery in to also then unplug the grid in, in, in order to, to make a statement to your grid operator, which is that you're really upset about the last 20 years and you want to make them understand that. The trouble is, and this is my contention to you, that it might be either very easy to agree with or very contentious, I'm not sure which, it may vary, is actually, that in my view, that's the last thing you want to do. You don't actually want to get off the grid when you stick a battery onto it. Your own economics are advantaged by being smarter than that. You can always disconnect later, but the trick is, the best economics to get going involve putting a battery in that's sized nicely for your average power consumption overnight, for your average consumption when the sun is not shining. If you do that and let the grid take on the load for the two places that battery is not enough, when you've run out of the energy overnight, and also even during the day when you don't have enough peak power to survive you coming home, the kids turning on the air conditioners, everything else going on at once, and your inverters run out of grunt, Right? You can put in enough electronics and enough batteries to go completely off-grid in the wilds of metropolitan Brisbane, but it's economically mad. It's the sort of thing only idiots like me should do, right? because it's not economic. You'd, instead of one battery, you might need ten, because you've got to survive a week full of rainy days, and even then, there might be one more rainy day. So now you're going to go out and buy a diesel generator, and now you're going to have to maintain that thing. The economics are actually not rational for doing that. It's more economically rational to treat the grid, even if you're only using it now for 5% of your total energy needs. That 5% is very expensive to get, any other, to get any other way. So think about it like renting a gen set you didn't have to install because the grid's still out there. So that's the kind of today reason why you might want to do that and why you might want to rethink the notion of the grid operators being an enemy here. The other thing to think about is what that does in the midterm if you do stay on the grid in the act of adding batteries to your solar system. Because once you do that, a few other things go on. It's very easy in a world where we have feed-in tariffs in it to misunderstand the motivation of the grid operators. I know because I've tried, if you threaten to add a battery to your existing solar system with a feed-in tariff, it's very hard to do that without losing the feed-in tariff. The suspicion is you're going to use the battery energy and feed that out to augment the solar panel energy and bust the rules of the feed-in tariff and lose it all. I do believe you can actually succeed in that without losing a feed-in tariff, and I'm in the process of going through that exercise in my own house in South Australia at the moment to see if I can manage to convince the, the, convince the, the SAPN that I can construct a picture they can understand that says, here's the battery and it's set up with the right stuff to never export its energy, but I want to leave the panels running. Because even though the panels, even though it's not sensible for me to put batteries in, I get a great feed-in tariff. I get it because I'm an early adopter, damn it, and as an early adopter, I also want to add the batteries I want to show my friends, that's the point. So, whether or not you hang on to the feed-in tariff, the thing to appreciate is the grid operators, the smart ones, or more accurately, the smart people inside each operator, because there's lots of you know, people in big organisations, they actually want the batteries to be there because the thing they desperately need with all these solar panels, panels out there is batteries deep in the grid to stabilise the frequency and voltage excursions that the grid, is, the grid suffers because of those solar panels. They want the batteries there, they want to be able, in the mid-term, to pay you to let your batteries stabilise their grid. There's actually an income opportunity here. If we can just get past this interim period where all these sticks get thrown into the air, confusing stuff happens and they all fall down in some other pattern. The thing that then happens after that gets even more interesting. If you wind up with the grid operators getting the right sort of religion here, and I actually think they've got it, they just haven't explained it very well to all of us, you ultimately wind up with a really nifty thing, which is the energy grid becoming a new sort of internet, something I claim to understand because I'm used to the old sort of internet, where it's a trading base on which you can trade energy with your neighbours, 
where you can build a microgrid but stay connected to the macrogrid and those microgrids can trade with each other. This opens up a really wonderful opportunity because there's a huge chunk of the population that can't stick solar panels on their roof. The orientation's wrong, they're covered in trees, or more and more, they're just sitting in an apartment building. If, you've, if the grid becomes a part of the solution here, becomes a trading base, your massive solar installation can be used to generate power on behalf of the people in the apartment building down the road. You can actually start balancing that out beyond more than just your own property boundaries. So there you go, there's a, there's a very fast kind of view about where I see this stuff going. And the essential message again is that one that says, when you add the battery, and I want you to add the battery, I think the batteries are an enormous part of the future here. Just bear in mind that your next reaction does not have to be to rip that grid cord out in sheer spite. You may in fact be ripping money out of your wallet. You can always do it next year if I'm wrong, just don't do it this year until you figured out that maybe I'm right. Thank you very much.